We live from New Delhi, you're watching TV India News Hour, India's Voice to the World. I'm Lepakshi Kurana coming up in the next hour. Celebration erupts in Istanbul as Turkey's main opposition party declares victory in pivotal municipality elections. Big blow to President Erdogan, who says party to carry out self-critique. is over as of today. It is done. U.S. and Israel to hold a meeting on Rafah on Monday, while Gaza ceasefire talks also resume in Cairo, even as fighting rages around Gaza's biggest hospital. Reserve Bank of India enters its 90th year of monetary policy making and regulating banks. Prime Minister Narendra Modi to attend celebrations recognizing its strong foundation. An Indian Air Force to showcase its strength and preparedness at the crucial 10 day war game Gagan Shakti 2024, which begins today. On to the details now in Turkey, the main opposition party secured substantial victories in Sunday's local elections, maintaining control over crucial cities. The results showcase the Republican People's Party retaining its grip on key urban areas, with most of the votes counted CHP leader Ekrem Imamoglu, led by 10 percentage points in the mayoral race in Istanbul, Turkey's largest city, while his party retained Ankara and gained 15 other mayoral seats in cities nationwide, including Izmir and Bursa, Adana and the resort of Antalya. The nation itself gives the order and the instructions, not just one person. Officials receive instruction from the nation. Period of one man rule is over as of today. It is done. The republic and democracy to go full speed ahead from now on. Today, the voters made a very important decision. The election results showed that the voters decided to establish a new politics in Turkey. The voters decided to change the 22-year-old picture of Turkey and open the door to a new political climate in our country. Well, supporters of Istanbul, Mayor Ikram Imamoglu celebrated following the results of local elections. The focal point of the electoral battle was Istanbul, a city of 16 million people, where Erdogan commenced his political journey as mayor in 1994. CHP's victory marked the worst defeat for Erdogan and his AK party in their more than two decades in power. In Ankara, a jubilant crowd congregated outside City Hall to celebrate Mayor and Opposition candidate Mansoor Yavas' resounding victory, chanting slogans of pride for their mayor, Ankara is proud of you. Hundreds of Kurds living in the southeastern Diyarbakir city also took to the streets to celebrate after the pro-Kurdish DEM party managed to reclaim local municipalities across the region on Sunday. Well, on the other hand, the election results of Turkey's local polls were a major setback for President Tayyip Erdogan since he had hoped to take back control of the city soon after clinching a third term as the president. For the first time since Erdogan came to power 21 years ago, AKP faced a defeat at the ballot box across the country. Acknowledging his historic defeat in the polls, President Erdogan said that the elections did not end as they had hoped. However, he said it would mark not an end for us, but rather a turning point. March 31st is not an end for us, but a turning point. 
the Turkish nation has conveyed its message to population by using the ballot box in the March 31st municipal elections. Well, the United States and Israel are expected to hold a virtual meeting on Monday to discuss the Biden administration's alternative proposals to an Israeli military offensive of Rafah. The news coming in from the Israeli and U.S. official sources. Israel last week asked to reschedule the meeting. Days after, Netanyahu abruptly cancelled the talks over the passage of a Gaza ceasefire resolution by the UN Security Council that the US decided not to veto. The US abstention from the vote pointed to frustration with Netanyahu, who rebuked Washington over the move. Meanwhile, Gaza ceasefire talks resumed once again in Cairo on Sunday, even as fighting rages around Gaza's biggest hospital, Al-Aqsa. Egypt is hosting an Israeli delegation for a new round of talks and a bid to secure a truce with Gaza's Hamas rulers. The talks resume even as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to keep up military pressure on Hamas while showing flexibility in the talks, saying that only that combination would bring about the release of hostages. Hamas would not be present at the talks in Cairo as the group would wait to hear from Cairo mediators on the outcome of their talks with Israel first. The two sides have stepped up negotiations mediated by Qatar and Egypt on a six-week suspension of Israel's offensive in return for the proposed release of 40 of 130 hostages still held by Hamas fighters in Gaza. And now DD India's Alex Cardia tells us what is expected from truce talks in Cairo. Israel has sent a delegation. They will be discussing the matter with those mediating countries, Egypt, Qatar and the United States, of course, playing that crucial mediating role. But Hamas has decided not to send a delegation. We know that the last proposal put on the table by the United States, accepted by Israel, was rejected by Hamas because uh, although they may be able to find an agreement on the release of hostages against Palestinian prisoners and a potential agreement on a ceasefire, the fundamental issue that remains with these ceasefire negotiations is that Israel's end goal is the complete eradication of Hamas and Hamas of course uh, does not want to reach that point and therefore you have this fundamental issue that Hamas rejected the last proposal because they said Israel would not consider the full eventual withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza, nor would they allow the full return of civilians to northern Gaza. So a lot of issues still to figure out, to work through. But that fundamental issue of Israel wanting the elimination of Hamas, but yet having to negotiate with Hamas for a ceasefire deal uh, remains a real problem. But we've seen a lot of pressure on the Israeli government now uh, by the families of those hostages protesting here in Tel Aviv just last night, saying that Prime Minister Netanyahu is standing in the way of a deal, is standing in the way of their loved ones coming home. So as those Israeli negotiators, negotiators head to Cairo, a lot of pressure on their shoulders from the families of those hostages, Shabendu. Well, Pope Francis called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and the release of all Israeli hostages. Amid renewed concerns about his health, Pope Francis presided over Easter Sunday Mass and delivered a major annual message that touched on conflicts across the globe with explicit appeals for peace in Israel, Gaza and Ukraine. I appeal once again that access to humanitarian aid be ensured to Gaza and call once more for the prompt release of the hostages seized on last October 7 and for an immediate ceasefire in the Strip. Let us not allow the current hostilities to continue to have grave repercussions on the civil population, by now at the limit of its endurance and above all on the children. Well, as the conflict rages on, the Israeli military said it killed a Hezbollah commander in an airstrike on a vehicle in Lebanon on Sunday. The killed commander has been identified as Ismail Al-Zin, a commander in the anti-tank missile unit of Hezbollah's Radwan forces. The Israeli army released a video showing several airstrikes on buildings with one caption reading, Strike on a significant terrorist operative of the Radwan forces, anti-tank unit of the Hezbollah terrorist organization. 
And moving on, a three-ship convoy left a port in Cyprus on Saturday with 400 tons of food and other supplies for Gaza as concerns about hunger in the territory soar. World Central Kitchen said the vessels were carrying ready-to-eat items, canned products, flour, rice and dates to prepare more than one million meals. It was not clear when the ships would reach Gaza. The first ship earlier this month delivered 200 tons of food, water and other aid. The United Nations and partners have warned that famine could occur in devastated, largely isolated northern Gaza as early as this month. Humanitarian officials say deliveries by sea and air are not enough and that Israel must allow far more aid by road. The top United Nations court has ordered Israel to open more land crossings and take other measures to address the crisis. Well, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas on Sunday swore in a new government headed by Mohammed Mustafa, an ally to President Mohammed Abbas. Mustafa formed a new cabinet in which he will also serve as foreign minister. He was appointed premier this month with a mandate to help reform the Palestinian Authority. He was also assigned to lead the relief and rebuilding of Gaza, which has been shattered by more than five months of war. Abbas appointed the new government in a demonstration of willingness to meet international demands for change in the administration. The new cabinet is made up of 23 ministers and four women and six ministers from Gaza will also include a state minister for relief affairs. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu underwent a successful hernia surgery. According to a statement released by his office, the procedure ended successfully and Netanyahu is in good shape and beginning to recover. Netanyahu was diagnosed with a hernia during a routine examination on Saturday. He was placed under anesthesia for the procedure. Justice Minister Yarev Levin, who also holds the role of Deputy Prime Minister, filled Netanyahu's role temporarily while he was conked out. In a news conference ahead of the surgery, Netanyahu said he was optimistic about the result of the procedure and that he will return to work very quickly. This is Netanyahu's second surgery since returning to the premiership in late 2022. And still to come on DD India News now. Cleanup efforts underway to clean up thousands of tons of steel debris from the collapsed bridge in Baltimore's harbour. Taiwan's Navy chief to visit United States this week, sources say. And two kilometer long table brings together iftar and Easter celebrants in Antwerp in Belgium. As a cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024, the battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on DD India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Lipakshi Kurana and moving on, Russia has escalated attacks on Ukraine's energy sector. It conducted a massive strike on objects of energy infrastructure and the gas industry on Sunday. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin has approved a decree outlining the routine spring conscription campaign, which includes 150,000 citizens for mandatory military service. More in this report. Russia is on high alert following a mass shooting at a concert hall in Moscow on March 22nd. On Sunday, Russia conducted a counter-terrorism operation regime in the southern region of Daxton. Security agencies detained three bandits who were planning a number of terrorist offences. On the other hand, Russian Air Force conducted a massive strike on objects of energy infrastructure and the gas industry in Ukraine. The Defence Ministry said that it used high-precision long-range air-based weapons and drones. 
As a result of this strike, the operation of defense industry enterprises involved in the manufacturing and repair of weapons, equipment and ammunition has been disrupted. All the goals of the strike have been achieved. Earlier on Friday, Russian missile and drone attacks hit thermal and hydropower plants in central and western Ukraine. The head of the Ukraine's largest private energy firm, DTEC, has said that five of its six plants had been damaged or destroyed with 80% of its generating capacity lost after two weeks of Russian attacks and that repairs could take up to 18 months. Ukrainian President Zelensky said Russia was carrying out vile strikes on the Ukrainian energy. Russian terrorists are now targeting such vile strikes to cause the energy bleeding of Ukraine. We give all necessary signals to our partners, all the specific requests to everyone who has the necessary air defense systems, to everyone who has the necessary missiles. Meanwhile, France will deliver hundreds of old armored vehicles and new surface-to-air missiles to Ukraine in its operation against Russia. According to French Defense Minister, Ukraine needs to defend a very long front line which requires armored vehicles. As the conflict rages on, Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a decree setting out the routine spring conscription campaign calling up 150,000 citizens for statutory military service. In Russia, all men aged 18 and above are obligated to undergo a year-long military service or equivalent training during their higher education. Compulsory military service has always been a contentious topic in Russia, with many men going to tremendous efforts to avoid receiving conscription papers during the twice-yearly call-up periods. Bureau Report, DD India. And Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky marked the second anniversary of the recapture of Kyiv region from Russian forces on Sunday. Zelensky paid tribute to those who died at the hands of Russian forces in the Kyiv suburb of Bucha two years ago. Speaking in front of local residents and top officials, Zelensky held a minute of silence. The Ukrainian military recaptured the small towns of Irpin and Bucha outside Kyiv in late March 2022. Ukraine says the Russian troops committed large scale atrocities in Bucha, Irpin and other places in Kyiv region after their military retreat revealed ravaged streets with civilian bodies. And moving on, Russia conducted a counter-terrorism operation in the southern region of Dagestan on Sunday, detaining three people. The National Anti-Terrorism Committee said during the inspection of the places where the criminals were detained, automatic weapons, ammunition and an improvised explosive device ready for use were found. Russia is on high alert following a mass shooting at a concert hall in Moscow on March 22nd, the deadliest attack in the country in 20 years with at least... 144 people killed. And shifting focus to China and Taiwan row now, Taiwan's Navy chief is expected to visit the United States this week amidst China raising threats toward the island. Tang Hua is expected to attend a military ceremony and discuss how to boost bilateral naval cooperation with the United States. Last week, a U.S. lawmaker visited Taiwan and reiterated the importance of a continued strategic cooperation between the island and the United States. The United States is Taiwan's most important arms supplier and international supporter, despite the absence of formal diplomatic ties. Taiwan's democratically elected government rejects China's sovereignty claims, saying only the island's people can decide their future. Meanwhile, according to an unsubstantiated report, Taiwanese outgoing president Tsai Ing-wen plans to flee in a U.S. plane if war erupts with China. Official Chinese news sources have repeated many times that Taiwan's military drills were rehearsals for ensuring the Tsai's plans. Taipei has repeatedly said the reports are false. And Patrick Fogg joins us with more from Singapore on this. Well, Patrick, uh, can you tell us more about the purpose of uh, this visit and how China has uh, reacted to this?
Well, Tangwa's visit, according to sources, is about boosting naval cooperation, bilateral naval cooperation between the U.S. and Taiwan. We're told that Tanghua will be in Hawaii first, where he will visit the home of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command before heading on to a conference near Washington on sea, air and space. Uh, we're also told that the Taiwanese side is trying to tee up uh, talks with the head of U.S. naval operations, Lisa Franchetti. But beyond that, it's difficult to say what precisely is on the agenda. Both sides have tried to keep this visit relatively low profile, as is always the case when it comes to Taiwanese officials heading to the U.S. Uh, the Taiwan Navy and the Pentagon have both declined to comment further on what the visit is about. Out, but uh, sources have said that this is also partly about bolstering efforts under the uh, island defense line concept, which is basically about bringing together Japan, the Philippines, Taiwan and Borneo to counter China, particularly as Beijing is becoming increasingly assertive in the Indo-Pacific. And that would make sense when you consider that there is also this trilateral summit that's due to take place in April between Japan. Japan uh, and the Philippines and the U.S. as well. So in terms of timing, this does seem to make sense and works along those lines. Uh, but as to how China's reacted to this, well, as you can imagine, uh, China isn't happy and uh, is opposed to any formal uh, visits by Taiwanese officials. And the foreign ministry uh, has said that it is opposed to, to uh, military collusion of any kind when it comes to Taiwan and the U.S. All right. China's reaction is very aversive. But uh, Patrick, tell me that separately, Taiwan's uh, former leader Ma Yingjiao is on a visit to China. What are the implications there? Yeah, well, certainly the timing is interesting, given that Tang Hua is also on this visit to the U.S. at the same time. This is an 11-day visit. Remember, Ma ying Zhou is still a senior member of the opposition Kuomintang, which advocates stronger ties with China. He doesn't have an official uh, position as such, but he's still an important figure, and he was also the first former Taiwanese leader to visit China last Last year, if you remember, before heading to Shenzhen, he's arrived there now. He spoke to reporters at the airport in Taiwan and said this is a visit about friendship and peace. And he wanted to convey a message to the people in China that Taiwan, uh, people in Taiwan are, are peaceful and uh, hope uh, that there is going to be a possibility of avoiding war between uh, the two sides. But one has to question just how wise all of this is uh, politically. If you remember around the time of the elections, Ma ying Zhou also called on the people of Taiwan to trust in President Xi Jinping. And many analysts have suggested uh, that that may have cost the KMT votes. Uh, as a matter of fact, we also uh, understand that Ma could, in fact, meet the Chinese president during his visit over the next two weeks as well. All right. Thank you so much, Patrick, for that information from there. And moving on, Maryland Governor Wes Moore on Sunday urged the Republicans to work with Democrats to approve the federal funding needed for rebuilding the collapsed bridge in Baltimore's harbor and to get the port economy back on its feet. The Biden administration released $60 million in initial emergency aid on March 28th to assist in cleaning up the bridge debris and reopening the port. Federal officials have told Maryland lawmakers the final cost of rebuilding the bridge could soar to at least $2 billion. Also, efforts are underway to clean up thousands of tons of steel debris from the collapsed bridge in Baltimore's harbor. Equipment on hand includes seven floating cranes, 10 tugboats, nine barges, eight salvage vessels, and five Coast Guard boats. Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed early morning on March 26, killing six road workers when a container ship nearly the size of the Eiffel Tower lost power and crashed into a support pylon. Much of the span crashed into the Patapsco River, blocking the port of Baltimore's shipping channel. 
And in one of the U.S.'s latest mass shootings, seven children between the ages of 12 and 17 were wounded. The shooting erupted outside a shopping mall in downtown Indianapolis late Saturday night. Deputy Chief of Operations for the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police told a news conference that the victims had been transferred to nearby hospitals and were in stable condition. According to Deputy Chief, officers who were in the area heard shots fired and found a large group of juveniles upon arriving at the scene near Circle Center Mall. Terry confirmed that more than one firearm was involved in the incident and said no suspect had been detained. The shooting is also being investigated. And severe hailstorms and thunderstorms have battered large parts of China, sprucing the country's meteorological observatory to issue a blue alert for extreme weather for the following days. Thunderstorms, gales and hail swept the region with a maximum wind speed reaching 28.54 meters per second. Heavy guests, heavy guests toppled greenhouses, trees and street lamps, causing an extensive damage to crops of seed and corns. Well, Vietnam aims to protect its forest in six north central provinces for which it is taking help from the World Bank. The Asian country recently received $9.9 million from the World Bank, equating to 20% of the remaining amount from the Emissions Reduction Purchase Agreement for 2018 to 2024. The World Bank has previously disbursed $40 million US dollars, equivalent to 80% of the agreement. The Vietnam Forest Protection and Development Fund has already dispersed Phase 1 funds to localities and made payments to forest owners. This sets the stage for Vietnam to launch a carbon credit market in the near future. And now let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. South Koreans will go to the polls on April 10th in a parliamentary election to elect a 300-member National Assembly as parliamentary and presidential elections are held separately in South Korea. President Yoon suk yeols Conservative People Power Party faces an uphill battle to win back a majority now held by the opposition, gaping margin of defeat and looming existential crisis among the ruling party's leadership. San Franciscans of all ages gathered for the annual tricycle race over the weekend. Dozens of people bumped and jostled past each other to see who was the fastest on three wheels, going down a serpentine stretch of Vermont Street in the city's Potrero Hill neighborhood. Though stay started by the adult in 2000, the race was far from an adult's only affair, with the street chock full of families with kids, especially toddlers. Thousands of Antwerp's residents came together in combining celebrations of Muslim Iftar and Christian Easton by sharing meal on a two-kilometer long table, thus breaking the record for the longest community dinner table in Belgium. The initiative promoted by the city of Antwerp was about inclusion and connection among cultures in times of tensions and polarization on a global level. And still to come in DD India News Hour. In an army test, the capability of Brahmo's supersonic cruise missile striking the long range target with precision and lethality. Attend a long war game, Gagan Shakti 2024 begins to test the Indian Air Force's preparedness to counter potential threats. And we get your report showing rising participation of youth in the elections in India over the years. As the cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024. The battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on DD India. In a
Welcome back. You're watching DD India News on Lepak Shikuran and time now for a quick recap of the headlines. Celebration erupts in Istanbul as Turkey's main opposition party declares victory in pivotal municipality elections. Big blow to President Erdogan who says party to carry out self-critique. Gaza ceasefire talks resume in Cairo even as fighting rages around Gaza's biggest hospital. Hamas to skip talks as it waits for offer. Netanyahu vows to keep up military pressure on Hamas while showing flexibility in the talks. Reserve Bank of India enters its 90th year of monetary policy making and regulating banks. Prime Minister Narendra Modi to attend celebrations recognizing its strong foundation. An Indian Air Force to showcase its strength and preparedness at the crucial 10-day war game Gagan Shakti 2024, which begins today. And moving on, the power of India's supersonic cruise missile Brahmos was witnessed during weekend over the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The Indian Army tested the capability of Brahmos supersonic cruise missile, striking the long-range target with precision and lethality. The long-range surface-to-air and air-to-air missiles were tested with state-of-the-art technology. During this time, the entire sky above the island group became as bright as the day. The Brahmos supersonic cruise missile is a medium-range weapon that can be launched from ships, submarines, fighter aircraft or transporter erector launcher. Recognized as the best and fastest precision-guided weapon globally, Brahmos has significantly bolstered India's deterrence capabilities in the 21st century. And the Indian Air Force is conducting the Pan-India Exercise Gagan Shakti from today. The aim of the exercise is to test the real-time coordination, deployment and employment of air power in a short and intense battle scenario. IAF will be exercising its entire war-fighting machinery to validate its concept of operations and war-waging capability. The focus of the exercise is to check the viability of operational plans. Gagan Shakti 2024 will see the Air Force carry out drills in coordination with the Army and Navy. All fighter aircraft, newly inducted assets, transport aircrafts, radars, air defense systems will be utilized in a network-centric environment. The logistic stamina of the IAF and its ability to sustain continuous operations through day and night will be tested. Meanwhile, the Army Commanders Conference is currently underway in Delhi. The apex leadership of the Army is deliberating upon the emerging threat scenario, operational challenges, reforms and plans for modernization. Defense Minister Rajnath Singh will be addressing the conference on Tuesday. One of the key items on the agenda will be cyber security, integration with other services and futuristic warfare technologies. Welfare of ex-servicemen, administrative and reforms will also fix. The Army Commanders Conference, the first for the year 2024, was held in virtual mode on March 28th and thereafter the two-day physical mode begins on Monday. And India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has hit out at Tamil Nadu's political party DMK for failing to safeguard the interest of Tamil Nadu. Prime Minister said that new details show DMK's double standards on Kattivu Island issue. Prime Minister posted on social media platform X and I quote, Rhetoric aside, DMK has done nothing to safeguard Tamil Nadu's interest. New details emerging on Kachtivu have unmasked the DMK's double standards totally. Congress and DMK are family units. They only care that their own sons and daughters rise. They don't care for anyone else. Their callousness on Kachtivu has harmed the interest of our poor fishermen and fisherwomen in particular. And India's External Affairs Minister and Senior BJP Leader Dr. S. Jay Shankar today hit out at Congress in Tamil Nadu's political party DMK over their handling of Kathivu issue. India's External Affairs Minister said that it is an issue which has been very much debated in Parliament and in the Tamil Nadu circles. He added that in the last 
five years, the Kattivu issue and the fishermen's issue have been repeatedly raised by various parties in the parliament, giving a background of the issue. Jay Shankar said in the last 20 years, 6,184 Indian fishermen have been detained by Sri Lanka and 1,175 Indian fishing vessels have been seized, detained or apprehended by Sri Lanka. not an issue which has suddenly surfaced. This is a live issue. It is an issue which has been very much debated uh, in Parliament, in, the, in uh, Tamil Nadu uh, circles as well. It has been the subject of correspondence between the union government and the state government. Now, every political party uh, in Tamil Nadu has taken a position on this. Two parties, the Congress and the DMK have approached this matter as though they have no responsibility for it. And for more on this, we are joined by a correspondent, Anbarasan from Chennai. Well, Anbarasan, uh, how is this uh, Kachtivu issue uh, reflecting in Tamil Nadu Lok Sabha elections? How do you think it's going to affect? Uh, the external affairs minister today held a press conference in Delhi, Delhi and he said that and he came heavy on Congress and DMK for, for their uh, two phases uh, for the Kachativ issue. And yesterday onwards, this Kachativ issue has been raised as the Prime Minister has tweeted already and the second tweet he tweeted today. And he also said the DMK and Congress only focus on the family and the family one family politics and they didn't care about uh, the pertaining issues of Tamil Nadu and this particular Kachativu issue uh, the external affairs minister said uh, the the, uh, the first prime minister Jawaharlal Nehru has said uh, uh, give away this island to the Sri Lanka I don't have any issue that is what the Jay Shankar external affairs minister said and also the then prime minister Indira Gandhi the period which is uh, 1974 the ceding over the island to the Sri Lanka has took place and uh, this all the issue the external affairs ministers came heavy on Congress and DMK they didn't have a proper uh, Issue, focus on this issue and the dealing is not that much a uh, proper sense so and also this issue last 20 years because of the island is uh, given to the Sri Lanka around uh, 6,000 plus fishermen and also 1,000 plus boated as uh, seized over and also arrested so these pertaining issue due to the island given to the Sri Lanka the Indian fisherman livelihood has also affected and the Indian sovereignty also been questioned by this uh, the decision took on 1974. All right. All the right. Prime Minister and this issue per particularly uh, taken over the, uh, by the State Chief K. Annamalai on yesterday and today uh, the State BJP President also said that the issue, the DMK has also consented over the issue and they didn't have anything to do with in the 1974. That year they didn't did anything for that and they didn't show any interest for the Tamil Nadu uh, people on this issue. Though, so this uh, pertaining issue on the Kachativu has been a continuous issue for the last 50 years of Tamil Nadu politics and also upcoming Lok Sabha election it uh, plays an important role because the BJP took over as the main issue on this and uh, yesterday and today the issue more become serious and uh, the parties the Congress President Malikachuna Karki said last 10 years the BJP is didn't do anything on this and suddenly taking over this issue for that reply as Jay Shankar has said this issue didn't take over on this time it always a issue uh, for the Tamil Nadu for the Tamil Nadu circle and across India uh, across Indian Parliament also Prime Ministers has said whenever the the Tamil Nadu chief ministers who were then they are wrote the letter to the union government and uh, take over that all responsibility to the union government and so this all issue always there and the SJ Shankar the external affairs minister said around 21 times the letter correspondence between the Tamil Nadu government and the union government as uh, took place on this issue the Kachativu as uh, always a uh, integral part which is uh, in before the right. Raja of Ramnad and uh, suddenly in 1974 this issue uh, ceded over to Sri Lanka has become a political issue so the Congress and DMK didn't uh, given a proper uh, response on this issue that is what the S.J. Shankar said on the press conference.
All right. Also, uh, Anbarasan, tell us that as you told us that the issue is going to pertain very uh, effectively during the elections. What is the mood of the election campaign and how is the political situation uh, there in Tamil Nadu right now? Just 18 days away for the voting date. The first phase itself, Tamil Nadu is going for the election. April 19, there is a voting day. So the election campaigning is in full swing across all Tamil Nadu 39 constituency. The DMK is uh, chief, MK star and the chief minister is uh, campaigning in the western parts of Tamil Nadu yesterday and today also is going to various assembly uh, Lok Sabha constituencies and the. Uh, Anamalai also in a campaigning and this political issue also the Kachetiv after yesterday's rise so it become a, a, a conversation between the DMK, ADMK and BJP regarding this that and also the other issues is developmental issue the DMK is uh, rise in all this campaigning uh, the delay in the development scheme implementation from the general government and also the ADMK is from mostly strongly accusing on DMK for the their mismanagement of right. uh, various uh, corruption management and also the uh, drug related issues so right. the campaigning in full swing all the the star candidates and also the yes. national leaders are coming to campaigning for the state in few, uh, soon for the for election hearing yes thank you so much anbarasan for giving us all those details from there and moving on, arrested Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal's custody with the enforcement ends today. He'll be produced before the city's Rouse Avenue court later today. The minister was arrested in the Delhi excise policy linked money laundering case on the 21st of March. The investigative team filed a remand request on Thursday, claiming they need more time to question Kejriwal. And India Supreme Court will hear a petition filed by Maulana Kamaluddin Welfare Society seeking a stay on the survey being done by Archaeological Survey of India's survey at Central India's Bhot Shala Monument. Earlier, the Apex Court declined to intervene with a recent order from the Madhya Pradesh High Court instructing the Archaeological Survey of India to conduct a survey of Bhot Shala, an 11th century protected monument. The High Court allowed ASI to survey the monument based on evidence the Petitioners presented in the court. Bhotshala is revered by the Hindus as a temple dedicated to Goddess Saraswati, while Muslims refer to it as Kamal Mola Mosque. And the Supreme Court will hear the petition of the Muslim side against worshipping in the Vyasti basement in the Gyan Vyapi complex in Uttar Pradesh. The High Court had dismissed the committee's plea in which it had challenged the District Court's January 31st order allowing Hindus to offer prayers in the cellar. The High Court ordered that worship will continue in the Vyasti Hekana of the mosque which stands adjacent to the Kashi Vishwanath temple. A survey conducted by the Archaeological Survey of India the court's order had suggested that the Gyan Vyapi Mosque was constructed during Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb's rule over the remains of a Hindu temple. And now let's get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. All right, BJP Manifesto Committee meeting will be held on Monday. The first meeting of the committee will be held at the central BJP office under the chairmanship of Rajnath Singh. On Saturday, BJP National President J.P. Nadda had formed a 27-member manifesto committee for the Lok Sabha elections. Finance Minister Nirmala Sita Raman has been made the convener of this committee. On the other hand, Congress Party is expected to announce the names of its Lok Sabha candidates for Bihar and Odisha on Monday. The Central Election Committee of the Congress met on March 31st to discuss the names. As part of the Grand Alliance with Rashtra Janata Dal and the left parties, the Congress will contest on nine Lok Sabha seats. In Odisha, names for 18 out of the 21 Lok Sabha seats are said to have been discussed. So far, the Congress has announced the names of 211 candidates. And still to come on DD India News Hour.
In Indian Premier League, Gujarat Titans registered a seven-wicket win over Sunrisers, Hyderabad. Flawless Janik Sinha wins the Miami Open for the first time and rises to world number two. And India is making significant strides in tiger conservation with Project Tiger campaign marking 50 years. As the cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024, the battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on DD India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Lipak Shikran and moving on, the Reserve Bank of India marks a significant milestone as it celebrates its 90th anniversary. RBI is organizing a commemorative event in Mumbai on the 1st of April. Prime Minister Narendra Modi will inaugurate the event. The inception of the Reserve Bank of India marked a critical juncture in India's economic history with the aim of centralizing the control of currency and credit under a single authority. Established on April 1, 1935, the RBI has played a pivotal role in shaping India's economic landscape and financial system over the decades. The role and responsibilities of RBI as a central bank is perhaps one of the widest among the central banks. And there is a good reason for it because each function of uh, Reserve Bank is uh, linked to other functions. So there are lots of complementarities between the functions of the Reserve Bank which help the Reserve Bank to take a holistic view of the financial stability situation, the financial conditions of the country and take appropriate steps in the best interest of economy and also to maintain uh, financial stability and price stability. To mark the occasion, RBI is organizing a commemorative event in Mumbai on 1st April. There will be year-long events and campaigns held to financially educate and empower common citizens. But throughout the year, we have planned uh, several events, the highlights of which include uh, two international conferences on relevant uh, topics. Uh, then we propose to hold an uh, all-India quiz competition among uh, college, college students. We also propose to organize uh, campaigns in many parts of the country to promote uh, financial inclusion. Throughout its journey, the RBI has achieved several milestones that have had a profound impact on India's economy. These include the introduction of the Indian rupee symbol, the liberalization of financial sector in the 1990s, and the implementation of innovative policies to combat economic challenges. As the RBI enters its 90th year, it faces new challenges and opportunities in an increasingly complex global economic landscape. These include addressing emerging risks such as cyber threats, strengthening regulatory frameworks and leveraging technology to enhance efficacy and transparency in financial services. Additionally, the RBI's initiative in promoting financial inclusion, enhancing banking infrastructure and regulating the financial sector have been instrumental in driving inclusive growth across the country. As we celebrate the 90th year anniversary milestone, it is imperative to recognize the Reserve Bank of India's invaluable contributions to India's growth story and advocate its continued endeavors in ensuring monetary stability, financial inclusion and sustainable development. Shama Mishra, DD India, Mumbai. Well, you're watching DD India News and time now for some sports news. Gujarat Titans registered a seven-wicket win over Sunrisers Hyderabad at the Narendra Modi Stadium in Ahmedabad on Sunday to take their second win of the tournament. GD managed to limit SRH to 162 for 8 in 20 overs thanks to Mohit Sharma's three-wicket haul before chasing down the target with 
five balls to spare. Sai Sudarshan top scored with 45, while David Miller and Shubman Gill chipped in with knocks of 44 and 36, respectively. Earlier, Sunrisers Hyderabad captain Pat Cummins won the toss and elected to bat first. Most of the batters got starts but failed to convert them into big scores. Heinrich Klaassen blasted 24 off 13 balls before missing a straight to one for leg spinner Rashid Khan to be bowled at a crucial juncture. Abhishek Sharma scored 29 in 20 balls, while Abdul Samad hit 29 off 14 balls. Mohit Sharma was the pick of the bowlers with three wickets. And Mumbai Indians will face Rajasthan Royals at the iconic Wankhede Stadium in Mumbai on Monday. Mumbai Indians have held a terrible start to their season under new captain Hardik Pandya. They lost to Gujarat Titans in their opening match by six runs in Ahmedabad. In their second encounter, they conceded a record 277 runs in their 20 overs against Sunrisers Hyderabad before being restricted to 246 for five in Hyderabad. After two disappointing results, Mumbai will be playing in front of their home fans for the first time. It'll be interesting to see the reception Hardik gets at the ground, which is the home of Rohit Sharma, who the all-rounder replaced as MI skipper. While Rajasthan Royals are two of the three unbeaten sides in IPL 2024 this far. They started with a 20-run win against Lucknow Super Giants in Jaipur. In their second game, Sanju Samson and company got the better of Delhi Capitals in a tight affair. And in tennis, at least Janik Sinner won the ADP Miami Open Masters 1000 title on Sunday. Sinner dominated Grigor Dimitrov 6-3-6-1 to win the Miami Open for the first time and rise to world number two. The Australian Open champion, who scooped a second Masters 1000 title following his success in Canada last year, has won 25 of his last 26 matches and has only lost three times since last year's US Open. The 22-year-old will take over the world number two ranking from his rival Carlos Alcaraz on Monday. Well, India's Project Tiger was established in India in response to the alarming decline in the population of tigers. Over the past 50 years, the Project Tiger, which was launched on the 1st of April 1973, has achieved commendable success, making significant strides in tiger conservation. India is the home to the world's largest population of the magnificent tiger. According to estimates, the tiger population of India is over 3,500, which makes India home to over 70% of all the tiger population in the world. A major credit for this incredible feat also goes to a project launched 52 years back. The Government of India has launched Project Tiger on 1st April 1973 to promote conservation of the tiger and biodiversity. Project Tiger has been the largest species conservation initiative of its kind in the world. Over the past 50 years, Project Tiger has achieved commendable success making significant strides in tiger conservation. Initially covering nine tiger reserves spanning around 18,000 square kilometers, the project has flourished into a remarkable accomplishment with 53 reserves spread across over 75,000 square kilometers, effectively covering 2.3% of India's total land area. Currently, the largest tiger population of 785 is in Madhya Pradesh, followed by Karnataka 563, Uttarakhand 560 and Maharashtra 444. The Government of India has taken several measures to save tigers under Project Tiger initiative. Measures taken under Project Tiger, protection of tiger habitats, anti-poaching measures, community involvement, monitoring and research, collaborations with other countries, implementation of laws and regulations. India has achieved several key outcomes by implementing Project Tiger. Increase in tiger population from an estimated 2200 in 2018 to over 3600 in 2024. Habitat conservation, ecological balance, community involvement. Continued efforts to protect tiger habitats and corridors are crucial for securing the future of India's tigers and their ecosystems for generations to come. Akshay Dongre reporting for DD India. 
All right, that's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Lipak Shikrana from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India News Hour.